thank you for joining us. This is for our first Barn Chats live session. And I'd like to welcome Dr. Jim Lowe. He's our expert veterinarian for equine. So if you have any questions throughout the session, please let us know via Facebook. If not, if we, for some reason we can't get to your questions or we don't see it by accident, we'll definitely get back to you as soon as possible. I um, just want to let you know my name is Tabitha and I am the marketing manager for the large animal equine and Dr. Jim Lowe, he is our resident veterinarian and I, um, I have two cats that I adopted and I live in Fort Worth, Texas so if you guys are ever in Texas please let me know and I'll take you on a tour of our facilities and Dr. Jim Lowe, you want to introduce yourself? Yes, uh, I am a Texas A&M graduate, 1995. I was in private practice for 18 years. Uh, my wife is a veterinary technician, and she and I had a mobile large animal business for a period of time where we just looked at large animals, specifically cattle and horses. Um, I've been with Vetikinol now for about four and a half years, and my responsibility are to support our sales force and do things like Facebook Live. And uh, So I come from a very clinical background. Uh, so the things we talk about are some personal ideas I have, some some things I've picked up along the way, uh, but always remember when dealing with these, especially when specific questions about your individual horse, uh, your veterinarian uh, is the best one to ask those questions mm -hmm. to because they can best give you the answers given the present condition of your horse. Yeah, excellent idea, yep. Mm -hmm. And I also wanted to let you know that we do have a contest that's running through uh, May 15th that you can be eligible to win a $250 gift card plus products. So definitely stay in tune and check us out with that. Uh, one of the questions that we have is um, someone has a new horse and they want to introduce their horse to, um, to another one. Okay. So just so. adding a new horse to the barn. You know, certainly we have to understand that, that uh, Horses are more social animals, they are more herd creatures, but they're also creatures of habit as well. So certainly when you bring in a new horse, it can be disruptive, there can be jealousy. There is a pecking order that will develop. So it's going to be very careful when you initially introduce this horse that it is monitored, um, that they are both being monitored. Perhaps they're put at different ends of the barn for a period of days, then brought closer and closer. But to certainly turn one out with another, one can expect some infighting again as they develop a natural social pecking order. Um, that's incumbent upon the breed. So certainly not something you want to do very slowly. Um, the horse that you have had previously that you're comfortable with, if that horse tends to be somewhat anxious, tends to have some anxiety, if anything changes, if there's any sort of disruption in that uh, living environment, uh, you might consider a supplement like equine zilkine. Zilkine just helps a horse cope better with the challenge. Uh, in the case of this challenge would be bringing a new horse into the barn. Um, so sometimes a supplement supplement like that will ease that transition, uh, but it's certainly something you want to be very cognizant of because uh, sometimes a little violence can ensue um, if we just inadvertently put two horses together until they have a chance to become more adapted to each other. Now you mentioned breeds. Does mm -hmm. it also matter if it's male, female, or? Oh, absolutely. You know, yeah. certainly, you know, certainly intact versus versus a, a, a gelding, for instance. Um, absolutely, sometimes there's breed differences. But many times, again, it's just, especially if there's more than one horse already on the farm, there's a pecking order, a social order that mm -hmm. has been established. So any sort of horse coming in is going to be seen as a threat, okay. um, and it's going to be tried to be put in its place to establish harmony again on the farm. Okay. And it's springtime. Yay! Yes. So let's talk about some tips and some steps that okay. folks can look for uh, because it is springtime. What sure. should they do? Well, I think classically, and everybody I think hopefully is very comfortable with spring vaccinations, we want to make sure these animals are well vaccinated um, for um, those pathogens moving into spring and summer. Certainly, it's usually time to deworm these horses based on whatever strategy your veterinarian has in place. Always a good time to have the farrier come out and check those feet. Uh, many times they've not had regular hoof trims and hoof care in the off season, and it's time to get those feet back into shape to make sure they're ready to go. Along those same lines, I think some things people don't think about is depending on what you're going to be doing with these horses uh, to make sure they're in shape. Um, if you are looking to enter the spring show season and summer show season and we've been off these horses for three or four months over the winter time, um, it's important to acclimate them again to exercise to slowly get their endurance built up, perhaps get a little weight off them depending on how well you, took, you fed them over the winter. But to get them into shape, I think another good thing to do is to check their teeth. Um, certainly um, their teeth need constant 
evaluation by a veterinarian, the way they grow and the way they grind against each other can affect their ability to take in nutrients. Um, perhaps a misconception is many times people don't think um, in the springtime when there's lots of grass and everything that it's important to look at the teeth and perhaps parasites, but actually the opposite is true. In the case of parasites, many parasites in those eggs are deposited in about the first two or three inches, uh, two to three inches of grass. And so certainly it's time to, this, to get the, the parasites under control, get those teeth looked at, especially if you're going to be doing some performing with them, um, and also make the, sure those horses are in shape. Don't forget about your Coggins test. Coggins a test is a test for equine infectious anemia. In most states, that is required yearly, especially if you're going to be going to sort, any sort of contests. Um, you're going to be required to do that. That's usually an annual blood test that your veterinarian can get for you. Um, and then lastly, and something I've experienced practicing in Texas, um, now is not the time really people think about their hay supplies, um, but in certain parts of this country where water is precious, um, by the end of the summer, um, grass is scarce, if not gone completely. So it might be a good time right now to start looking at your needs for the hay for the next coming few months, especially through the summer months, and locking in perhaps a good supply of hay to get you through uh, should we experience some drought. Yeah, good point. Mm -hmm. So I'm um, kind of back on behavior. You mentioned mm -hmm. this, introducing a new horse. Um, so I guess some other concerns are, you know, vet visits. Sometimes mm -hmm. that the horse is terrified of the veterinarian mm -hmm. or a farrier um, or maybe a storm coming. Mm -hmm. So any tips on, on that, sure. the behavior? Sure. sure. I think in understanding a horse, first and foremost, is we have to understand or remember what a horse has done throughout centuries and throughout eons to adapt and to keep itself safe. First and foremost, a horse has great legs to run. So a horse's first response to any th fear or threat is to run. That's why when the farrier comes out and picks those feet up, it's taking away mm. the primary defense mechanism a horse has. So when dealing with the farrier, if a horse has trouble with this farrier, uh, we need to work with that horse at picking up those feet and putting them down, about picking those feet regularly. Certainly, um, a supplement, again, like equine zilking, can just alleviate some of the anxiety that comes when they see that farrier truck come out. Uh, the pro nice thing about Zilkeen is because it's not a drug, it simply focuses that horse and it would allow you then to implement some of that behavior modification, picking up those feet constantly, uh, allowing them to acknowledge the fact that when I pick those feet up, nothing bad happens because so much of it is simply their natural defense. It uh, feels like you're taking away my defense mechanism by picking up the feet. Same thing with the veterinary visits. Things are happening with that vet visit, usually vaccinations or oral exams or foot exams. And again, these are things that these horses perhaps have not been acclimated to. Mm -hmm. So again, the more you can work with these animals prior to, as far as picking up their feet, you know, looking in their mouth, practicing and giving them shots, walking them around, and again, perhaps adding in a supplement like Zilkeen so they don't begin to ratchet up those levels of anxiety, those symptoms when they see that vet truck. And products like Zilkeen can be used for extended periods of time, um, so perhaps we can use it before, during, and after that vet visit and allow them to get through one successfully and perhaps not need it moving forward if we implement some other strategies. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Now, with picking up the feet, you had mentioned trying to do that on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Do you also recommend maybe giving the horse something that they like um, in return as a reward? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And there's various techniques, and there's people that are specialized in, in, in techniques that can help you with that. But certainly horses understand rewards. Mm -hmm. um, and what we're trying to do is make things as pleasant as possible. Um, it's, uh, horses also have a trait of not forgetting a bad experience. Oh, so boy. all these new experiences we want to try to make as pleasurable as possible. So certainly rewarding them appropriately when they uh, uh, behave accordingly is never a bad idea. So they'll look forward to the farrier visits. <laughs> all right, another question that we have is um, we just got a new horse and... It's, I'm sorry, I got the wrong one. one. This one. Um, for a first time horse owner, what are some tips? Because they're excited to have a new horse, but what's, what's something that they should or should not do? Wow, first time horse owner, congratulations. <laughs> um, ours, is, uh, ours is still in Georgia, though we have since moved to Florida, but we'll get her down here soon. But uh, I think first and foremost, and I mean this sincerely when I was in practice, my favorite clients, my favorite horse clients, were the people that were new to first-time horse owners that came to me and admitted that from the outset. 
that they were new, they didn't understand, but they were anxious to learn. They were, they were pumped and stoked to have a horse, and they were just sponges for knowledge. Those people were so easy to work with because they were accepting of advice. They had no bad habits, shall we say. Um, so first and foremost, thank you for admitting your first time, Orna, because there's so much information out there. Find some knowledgeable people that you believe in. Perhaps it's where you're keeping your horse, if it's at a stable. Certainly your veterinarian and their staff. Um, but there are a lot of advice out there, so you really need to focus on getting two or three good sources um, and doing your own research. You know, there's lots of research online, lots of good books, um, but really being accepting of advice uh, from those that are doing it the way that you think it should be done um, and listening and learning. Clinics, 4-H, there's all kinds of avenues. Um, and again, depending on where you keep your horse, um, there may be resources right there available to you that will steer you steer you in the right direction but congratulations and good luck yeah that's a great <laughs> point great point okay we have a question from mary she asked what's a good product for bug bites she's thinking it might have been ants well mary um in generalities there's a lots of good products out there um and really depending on your locale i would first ascertain exactly which insects there are uh, but there are a variety of products now um, in sprays the problem is especially for dealing with insects is they adapt so readily. So meaning mm -hmm. the product that worked last spring may not work this spring, and we experience that all the time in practice. So I would for sure diagnose exactly what it is, the critter that's doing the damage to you, and then recommend what is being uh, recommended for this spring, because again, it changes. And again, your veterinarian would be a great resource for that um, to get you uh, pointed in the right direction. Wonderful, and we just had a question pop up about um, her horse has... No seams. Yep. No seams, little biting insects. I, my family and I live in Florida, I know exactly. So again, um, they can be simply just irritation from the bites, or these allergies can have secondary effects that may be what you're seeing with the whelps and things. Again, visit with your veterinarian, because first and foremost, it'd be great to prevent the bites themselves, but if the bites are occurring, there may be both topical and systemic therapies um, that are available to you, um, and they can best uh, get a therapy regimen together for you that would both most benefit your horse. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. Another question that we have is, um, what do you recommend to help with horses, their joints? Um, because, you know, some of them, some of the horses, it's just springtime and maybe they haven't had a lot of activity. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you recommend starting them off slow mm -hmm. or if they've already been in some type of process? Yeah, I think if this horse has been laid up for an extended period of time, then absolutely you want to start gradually. And most of you already have a regimen for that. I mean, if we're looking at the joint specifically, just as in us, earlier is better. Uh, we know horses as early as two years old begin to develop joint issues just from the, the trauma of exertion, especially if these are performance horses, mm -hmm. horses in training that are asked to do a lot. So certainly I think there's enough research out there to talk about putting them on some sort of jo joint supplementation much, much earlier on than waiting until the radiographs have been seen at the veterinarian and there's significant changes in those joints. At that point, it can be very difficult to really relieve all the discomfort and all the issues. So the earlier, the better. Um, certainly there are products out there with any numbers of ingredients. Uh, Betakinol has just, is just fixing to launch a brand new product mm -hmm. that really looks at the joint and osteoarthritis from an immune perspective. Uh, versus things like non-steroidal anti-inflammatories and relieving inflammation. Uh, what this product does is actually train the body uh, to, again, to not react to certain things that that broken down joint may be producing. It's a product called Flexidin UC2. Flexidin UC2 is uh, undenatured when given daily can actually train the immune system to not react as it might naturally would. So it's brand new research, brand new product, and we're really excited to present it. But Always start early if possible because, mm -hmm. again, when we get to significant radiographic changes, there's usually more modalities that are necessary. Um, and, again, something you can certainly visit with, with your veterinarian about, again, given the function of your horse, the nature of what you're going to be doing, and what you're asking them to do, they can curtail a, a good uh, therapy for you. Yeah, and also you mentioned the Flexin and UC2 mm -hmm. that we're about right. to launch out to yeah. the public. So with that, um, wouldn't you recommend using that product on a daily basis? Absolutely, and that's the intention. And most any of the nutraceuticals out there for in, in the veterinary market um, are daily. Because again, once we start these products, it's really a, a situation where they're going to be on them daily. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, unlike the glucosamines and chondroitins you may be familiar with, the Flexidin with the Undenature Type 2 Collagen is a completely different product. 
given once a day um, that's backed by research to show, again, just changing the body's immune system from what it might normally do when it's uh, addressing a broken down joint. Do you want to tell the audience a little bit about the mm -hmm. Flexin UC2, why it's, it's exciting for us? Yeah, well, the undenatured type 2 collagen is actually a proprietary ingredient. It's a, it's a, it's a product, a collagen, a protein is what collagen is that's been manufactured in a patented way. So what it does is it's training the immune system versus reacting to the broken down cartilage that's in the joint. It's training the body to not react to it. When the body naturally reacts to protein in the body, uh, there's an immune reaction. And with that immune reaction, we get further breakdown of the joint itself. What in giving this oral form of undenatured type 2 collagen, we're able to train the body's immune system to no longer make that immune reaction. And in doing so, we allow the body and the cartilage to heal itself much more naturally. Again, it's an ingredient that's with a lot of research out there um, that has been shown to be beneficial in, in dogs and horses um, and actually in people as well. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And since it's springtime, one of the questions that we have is suggestions on transitioning the horse to grass. Or is there... Yeah, and in, in, in general, and in, in speaking in very general um, things, when we're looking at green grass in the spring, we have to be very careful. Green grass is very low in fiber, but it's very high in carbohydrates. So if we inadvertently put horses on that grass too quickly, those excess carbohydrates can disrupt the health of the gut. In disrupting the health of the gut, it can actually, it can actually change the bacterial population within the gut to a population that secretes toxins. And these toxins can classically actually go to the hooves and cause a process called laminitis. Laminitis is an, is an inflammation between the bone and the foot and the hoof wall. And with inflammation, these horses can become very, very painful. Um, it can actually be a life-threatening con condition. So many horses have to be transitioned very, very slowly onto lush green grass. Again, because of that very, very high fiber content. This is exactly the type of scenario you need to visit with your veterinarian about because certain horses are much more predisposed to exposure to green grass where they can potentially be much higher risk. Um, there are horses out there that unfortunately can never be exposed to lush green grass. Uh, but again, it's related to the fiber content and the excess carbohydrates in that green, green grass. Not nearly a concern later in the spring and summer when that grass has died off, when it's not nearly as lush. So again, visit with your veterinarians about your specific horse, and they can come up with a plan that would be best for you. Wonderful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Another question that we have is regarding salt blocks. Yep. Again, so moving into the summer, again, on an individual basis, we have horses that tend to drink more than others. Uh, we have some horses that tend to sweat more than others. Oh, individual variation, and certainly this may absolutely be an opportunity to visit because certainly what they're talking about are adding ex extra salt. These salts are basically drink promotants to get these horses to drink. We don't need them getting dehydrated or losing electrolytes. So really it's going to be based on need of your animal and then more importantly which one they would prefer um, and of course your budget um, and what you're able to get uh, what you have access to. Great. We have another question that came in. Um, she's asking, should every horse be treated for sand in the gut? Wow, treated for sand in the gut. So what they're talking about is, depending on the areas where you may live and the types of soils you may live in and the type of uh, pasture you may have, horses can at times ingest large amounts of sand. And as you can only imagine, ingesting large amounts of sand can be increasingly irritating to the bowel. Um, it can also, in, in, in horrible situations, actually cause an obstruction or a blockage. So there are many number of products out there to periodically give to horses um, to clear this sand out, to remove it from the system, to relieve that irritation, and allow it to pass through naturally. So local knowledge is grand, local knowledge from your veterinarian, your horse club, to see which areas tend to have more problems with sand. Certainly different regions will have more, more problems, and with that they can give you the recommendations on a good rotation um, and a good product for that. But not every horse, depending on the area, is going to be exposed to that, but certainly in the areas I practiced, um, it was a very real problem. So visit, visit with your veterinarian, visit with your, uh, your horse owner buddies, um, and they can come up with a plan and help you with that. Great. Well, let's transition and talk about the new foals out there. Yes, yes. So uh, maybe someone has a, a mare that's about to give birth. Um, so do you have any tips that we should or should not do? 
Sure. Well, yeah, first and foremost is let nature take its course. Um, horses, thankfully, for the most part, are very, are, are very adept at having foals naturally. Um, horses are completely different from, say, cattle um, and can actually be made to be very nervous if they're pressured, mm. if they feel like they're being confined, where they will actually not go into labor. Um, so I always kept, kept a hands-off approach. I tried to get people to leave them alone because usually when you turned your back on them for any period of time, they would have the baby before you got back. So again, let nature take its course. I think what's important, uh, a healthy baby will be back on its feet within about two hours in suckling. They're very quick to get on their feet. They're very precocial when they're born. Precocial just simply means when they're born, they're very aware and very cognizant of the pressures and stresses out there. So you wanna be very, very gentle with them. Um, certainly you wanna contact your veterinarian immediately. Your veterinarian's gonna to wanna to come out and do a few things. They're gonna to wanna to give that baby a full examination. Um, after about 12 hours, they're gonna come out and take a little blood to make sure that mare is suckled, I mean, excuse me, the foal is suckled adequately to make sure um, it has gotten full um, colostral transfer, had gotten enough of the colostral antibodies for mom. They're gonna check it for little umbilical hernias. Um, they might even give it a little tetanus booster some of these guys are born a little bit constipated and they might even give them an enema just to make sure they can go ahead and, and uh, defecate normally. Then they're going to give the mare, of course, a, a full, uh, full checkup. They may want to boost her vaccination, specifically something like tetanus. And then what's really, really key in a, in a mare is that we make sure um, they examine that placenta. That full placenta, that full bag that was around that baby will be expelled and that veterinarian is going to want to uh, check every inch of it. Any sort of that remnant material that may have been retained inside the mare can make her dead dangerously ill, and it's something you want to have addressed very, very quickly. So yeah, so usually within about the first two to 12 hours, especially 12 hours so we can get that blood test to make sure its immunity is strong, uh, you're going to want that veterinarian out to take a look. Okay. And I think one of the last questions is, um, I hear a lot of my friends, they'll say that their horse is colicking or mm -hmm. has colic. Um, do you have any tips on how to help and first of all do you want to explain yeah. what yeah. colicking is? Yeah, colic is simply a catch-all phrase for any sort of abdominal pain. So I always used to tell clients when you can think about colic as, as causing abdominal pain, think about how many things causes headaches in people. Mm -hmm. I mean the list is overwhelming. Yeah. So colic in and of itself is just simply saying that horse has an upset stomach and that can be for any variety of reasons. Certainly there are mild, mild colics where horses develop some gas pockets within them. Sometimes walking them for extended periods of time, allowing that gas to pass through is simply all that's needed. Unfortunately, colics can be as significant as some sort of blockage and that requires immediate veterinary therapy, immediate veterinary support. So unless you're, um, so I think any indication, and, and I guess I should say indications of colic can be excessive pacing, certainly laying down, rolling, looking at their belly, kicking at their belly, those would be all indications that something's not right. If you have a chow hound for a horse like ours is, and they walk in one day and just look at their feet and walk away, that should be an alarm going off in your head that something is wrong. So again, colic is just an abdominal discomfort. The gravity of the situation best be assessed by a veterinarian. Okay, okay. and we have a couple more questions. One is from Mary, and she says that she lives in the desert What's some products to have in a medical care kit, especially when trail riding? Is there anything wow. that you recommend or? Yeah, we're probably going to be pretty limited. You know, again, it depends on uh, where you're living and what regulations are, but certainly you want to keep a first aid kit on hand. Certainly uh, lots of bandage materials. Um, it's always a good thing to have some wound spray for topical application to some cuts and bruises. Um, as far as medications, that would be something to visit with your veterinarian about they may be able to uh, recommend a few products for you. I think certainly to have some insect spray on hand as well. Always don't forget about sunburn. Some of these fair skin, especially around their noses and around their eyes, around their ears, can be very sensitive to the sun, so make sure your horse is protected adequately. Um, but again, as far as specific products like that, your veterinarian can be of the best help for that. Okay, we have another question. Uh, says, what products do you recommend for overly aggressive mares on their heat cycles? I have a mare that will stand and spray for geldings and gets pretty nasty with people when she's in heat. <laughs> this mare has never had a full. Ah, uh, mares and mares. So yeah, <laughs> there are certainly some products that might be available. Not everyone works in every situation. Certainly there are some things that uh, research shows might be of benefit some that research show may not be of benefit. That's really a specific question to visit with your veterinarian about who perhaps give you some thoughts as to what may be best to control that situation.
Okay, I'm trying to see if we have any other questions right now. And thank you again for tuning in. We really appreciate all the questions that you have. Um, and again, if you have additional questions that maybe we weren't able to answer, definitely let us know via Facebook. And don't forget about the promotion that we're running until May 15th, where you can run $250 of a gift card. And thank you so much, Dr. Lowe. Thank we you. really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.